and welcome back everyone. This is our last session of the day. I can't believe how much we've learned and discussed in the last two days, but we are almost there. Okay, so our last keynote is, uh, let's try that again. <laughs> our last keynote is William McDonough of William McDonough Innovations. Uh, William is a globally recognized leader in sustainable design and development. In 2002, he co-authored Cradle to Cradle, Remaking the Way We Make Things, which became a seminal text of both the sustainability and circular economy design movements. McDonough advises leaders on ESG, sustainability, circular economy, and design of products and facilities. He's worked with CEOs of companies like the, Mo the Ford Motor Company, Gap, Google, Herman Miller, Hero Motor Corp, Procter & Gamble, there's a lot here, <laughs> Starbucks, Unilever, and Walmart. He's also an architect with William McDonough and Partners, a firm known for having designed many notable landmark buildings of the sustainable architecture movement, including Ford's River Rouge plant in Dearborn, Michigan, Herman Miller's Greenhouse Factory in Holland, Michigan, Nike's European headquarters in Hilversum, Netherlands, and YouTube's headquarters in Silicon Valley, California. Through MBDC, he created Cradle to Cradle certified, he created the Cradle to Cradle certified products program, an independent science-based standard recognized by the world's leading retailers, including Amazon, Home Depot, Walgreens, and Walmart. He received the Presidential Award for Sustainable Development in 1996, the first US EPA Presidential Green Chemistry Challenge Award in 2003, and the National Design Award in 2004 and a Fortune Award for Circular Economy Leadership in 2017. Time Magazine recognized him as a hero for the planet, noting his utopianism is grounded in a unified philosophy that in, demonstra that in demonstrable and practical ways is changing the design of the world. As William lives in the United States, this talk is pre-recorded, so let's hear what he has to say. Hello. I am William McDonough, and I'm here to talk about design for the UK Design Council and the idea of designing for the planet. I've been a designer for many years. I'm 71 now. I've been designing since I was 21, so it's 50 years now. And when I started thinking about design, I was at college, and I was reflecting on my childhood and thinking to myself, I'm in college now. I cannot try and understand what happened because I was born in Japan after the Second World War. And I couldn't understand why people would try to kill each other as a baby, a child. And I couldn't understand how a city could disappear in seconds. And I thought, well, here I am. I'm 18 years old. I'm in an Ivy League university, I can ask these questions, get answers. But I couldn't. I asked the question, why do people kill each other? And I ended up taking international relations only to find out that we were dealing with detente and that it was mutually assured destruction driving so much of the political agenda from a, a sense of well-being. And here today, we still suffer this. And then when asking about how we could destroy cities so quickly and how destruction is so quick when building is so slow, my professor gave me the special theory of relativity and said solve e equals mc squared, and then you'll have a sense of it. And so after looking at this post-it notes and or in those days index cards everywhere of e equals mc squared, I realized I can't do this. But then it occurred to me looking at the fireplace that the log burning in the fire was negative entropy. It was order out of chaos. So E equals MC squared is physics and chemistry, E and M, and the constant is the speed of light. If that's not a big enough number, we can square it, which means that if E equals MC squared and the M is in any way a positive number, as in one hydrogen atom, then the E is C squared. There's the atom, there's the bomb. So I realized I wasn't gonna be very good at international relations and I wasn't gonna be very good at science per se. So I decided to go into the arts and 
and do creative work. And I thought, if I ever do creative work as an architect, I'm going to design buildings like trees. Because the sun shines on the Earth's surface and takes carbon from the atmosphere, water, minerals. And we have a planet that sort of looks like Venus. And then pretty soon, the E and the M come together, and we end up with life. And biology arrives. And in a way, a log burning is entropy. All these elements leaving now to return, per se, minerals, uh, water, and so on. But what would negative entropy look like? What would order out of chaos look like? And I couldn't find it in the physics library. And then I realized when I came back and looked at the fire burning down that the log had been the order out of chaos. Biology, life itself. So at that point, I thought, well, this is great. I'll design buildings like trees. And so when I think about what a tree can do, it can sequester carbon, release oxygen, it emits oxygen. So all this zero emissions talk we have is about carbon or things that are damaging. But what about good emissions like fresh water? What about um, oxygen? So it's not that simple. It's about qualification, not just quantification. So let's emit good things. Let's sequester things we want to sequester and so on. So that's when I decided to design buildings like trees. Negative entropy. Then we had the energy crisis in 1973. And I remember thinking, I have to design a solar powered building and I want to do something in Ireland since my ancestors had come from there. So I decided to do a solar house experiment in other, Southern Ireland. And I did, and I went and built it by hand, working with local craftspeople. And it was such an amazing experience, not easy. I had a broken back, but it was a great experience. And to connect to that idea of the sun, the earth, and humility, because when the energy from the sun meets the dead rock with water, and we get soil, we get humus. And when we get humus, we get humans. The word human is a still a derivation of the word humus. We are soil people. And it's also the root of the word humility which means to be grounded. So for any of us who have problems as designers with humility, which we've noticed occasionally, just remember it took us 5,000 years to put wheels on our luggage. We went to the moon before we put wheels on our luggage. We put two wheels on and we put on four wheels. You may note now we have eight wheels on the luggage. So all this, you know, after we went to the moon. So sometimes we have to discover the obvious. So that's when I, when I was working on this at Yale and a professor came by, very famous for white houses with giant windows. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm working on a design for a solar heated house in Ireland. And he said, young man, solar energy has nothing to do with architecture. So I proceeded because Vitruvius seemed to think it did. And it was apparent out there in the sunshine that it had a lot to do with it. So I started designing buildings like trees. One of the first buildings I did that got a lot of attention on this front was a skyscraper master plan and tower for a site in Warsaw. And we won the competition. But the idea was they could have the design of the building, but we calculated how much carbon it would release from coal burning to make the building and to operate it. And it turned out very almost equal, by the way. The embedded energy and the operating energy were about the same. I thought, well, how much do we need to offset this building? And it was 10 square miles of trees. So I said, you can have the design of the building, but you have to plant 10 square miles of trees. This is in 1989, it's 33 years ago. So uh, people thought it was a bit odd. But it was, at the time, priced at $150,000. It was one-tenth of the advertising budget, believe it or not, in, in, the, in communist Poland. So that was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And they didn't put it down. They just said, look at this. And then working at a daycare center 
in Frankfurt, also competition. And when we explained it, we said it's a negative entropy building. It's order out of chaos for the children. So it's solar powered. Children can operate it with shades and shutters that can move. It has food growing on the roof. It has connection to the underground geothermal stable temperatures. It has these shutters in the skylights that they can let in the winter sun and, and block the summer sun if they want. It had a laundry for the parents that could have solar powered cleaning while they wait for their children and so on and so forth. Something we want to see more of, not less of. And then as we moved on, I remember we did a building for a forest center in Louisville, Kentucky. And we used the old uh, bourbon vats and things like that. And we built a building out of wood and it's a building that is a tree in a forest. And even the roof is covered with plants and it's solar powered, it purifies water. It does all things trees do. So it's trees and sand, a little bit of steel. And then for NASA, they asked me to work on the Mars Space Station many years later, and I said, I'd love to work on that, but first, could we come back to the blue planet before we go to the red one? And could we get the design teams from NASA for the space stations, and can we work on that? And they, they did. So we built a building at NASA Ames, their research center in Mountain View, California, that uh, is a building that can produce 40% more renewable power than the building requires and purify its own water. We did it with rocket scientists, and we perceived and achieved all this with the same as a federal budget for an office building. And they say you don't need to be a rocket scientist to do something smart, but what if you were? You might put wheels on your luggage, for example. So as we worked on this kind of thing, we then evolved it into what we call cradle to cradle and then the circular economy. And so I wrote the book Cradle to Cradle with a German chemist. In 2002, we published it. And the idea was to look at the world as a biological nutrition and technical nutrition. So these two metabolisms, and we would design things to be safe for soil, and we had designed things to be put into cycles of resourcefulness. So that was a fundamental way to look at the world. It's not just make stuff, take stuff, throw it away. Linear economy, it was really the base of the circular economies. And so that's what we worked on. And then we designed a whole office complex in the Netherlands that was this way. The first circular economy real estate development. And all the materials we were looking at were cradle to cradle and even certified by our protocol that had been put into a not-for-profit independent third-party assessment organization certifying. So that was just amazing. And we started to look at buildings as material banks, where, and we even you know, put these ideas in the public domain to think about the idea of design for disassembly, of uh, cataloging all the materials in a building using our tools and techniques today that we have. And today we have RFID tags, radio frequency identification, at very tiny scales, powered by your phone. And we can actually mark everything and we know where it came from. We know what it can be used for in the future. And so that becomes a material bank for future generations. So really an important idea. But the idea also that they're safe and healthy so our fundamentals of Cradle to Cradle are five conditions. Material health for ecosystems and humans, circular economy, reusability, recyclability, regeneration, composting, so on. And then we have clean water. So we've even designed fabrics. The first one I did was in the 90s. And we looked at all the chemicals in the textile trade, 8,000 and eliminated 4,362 based on the criteria of no more endocrine disruption, no more cancer, no more birth defects, no more of this. So working with the chemists, you know, we developed all these lists of materials and we were able to do the fabric with 38 chemicals instead of 256. And the water was so clean coming out of the factory in Switzerland 
that they could just reuse it because it was the cleanest Swiss drinking water. What an idea. So we now have factories in India this way, in Bangladesh, where we've been doing products with uh, different companies. And it's exciting to watch because they're renewably powered. One is wind, one is solar. Their, their water's clean, the people are treated with dignity and grace, and you end up with very cost-effective production. It's safe. So safe, then circular. Safe, then regenerative. So as we looked at it and developed the concept for the circular economy, which we then presented, and I was the chair of the Meta Council for Circular Economy at the World Economic Forum, and we brought these ideas into commerce, starting with companies like Herman Miller in the United States and Steelcase. It's not for one company, it's for everyone. And it's not just for one industry, it's for all industries. And it's not just at one scale. The marvelous thing about this is like a fractal. It's self-similar at every scale. So we can work at the molecule level, safe, healthy, and so on. We can work at the product level, ingredients. We can work at buildings, we can work at regions, and we can even do planetary. So what was exciting is to then look at that and say, this is really a kind of design, philosophy. Time Magazine had a cover story when me featured as a hero for the planet, which is rather strange and um, requires humility. But the statement they made at the beginning was that McDonough has developed a unified philosophy that in demonstrable and practical ways is changing the design of the world. And the other day someone called me and said, what was that unified philosophy? And it's so obvious. It's that simple. It's nature, obviously. So nature is, has an astonishing power if we think of it as intentional and design. So nature doesn't have a design problem. And when you think about just two things, say a natural object and an unnatural object, if you go to a beach covered with pebbles, we all turn into Andy Goldsworthy. We start sitting there on our knees or on the beach and we're laying up stones and picking colors and shapes and taking some home in our pockets for our mothers to dig out of the laundry, or whatever we're doing. And then we realize that when we think about it, gravel, where we go to human-made pebbles, we don't sit there and start collecting it and putting it in our pockets. It's strong, it's raw. It may not be attractive even, but nature is beautiful and, and it knows how to find beauty by just being. So I like to work with that all the time. So when we look at these things, we realize now we can have a circular carbon economy, which we need. So I wrote a protocol on that for the G20, which we presented at the G20 in 2020 and was endorsed by the leaders. And the idea is to look at carbon within this diagram of a circular economy, but realize that carbon is both a material and a fuel, and that's the problem. We burn it. We can make things with it, and we can burn it. So the notion that we can look at hydrocarbons as hydrogen and carbon, or we can look at carbon, instead of just saying carbon is bad, we need zero emissions, net zero, we can say carbon is the source of life. We can design with carbon. And let's design things that don't involve burning carbon. So we'll use renewable power, we'll have clean water, and so on. But we can actually design for this as we go forward. Because we can even take hydrocarbons and think of them as hydrogen and as carbon. So we're actually working on experiments now, very delightful, which follow a sort of obvious idea that you could make, uh, you could use petroleum and petrochemicals and hydrocarbons and so on as a production of hydrogen. And then we have carbon, but instead of making the carbon a fugitive problem in the atmosphere, which is a nightmare, or bottles in the ocean, we can have living carbon, durable carbon, and then stop making fugitive carbon. So it's very exciting. And uh, I like to work on these things, and we've got some very exciting things coming by design that are very big on the idea that we have to remove carbon from the atmosphere now. It's not just enough to reduce our emissions. It is clear from the latest IPCC report 
we will have to do carbon removal and not just nature-based solutions. I think we all prefer to let nature be recovered to the full extent possible, what I would call the regenerative biosphere. And we should do everything we can to restore grasslands, to heal soils, to, to even whales are full of embedded carbon, if you can imagine. Um, that's why they used to burn them for light. But we can do this. This is a regenerative biosphere. So this we call regenerative. And it's in the cycle of life, powered by the sun. But we can also have a circular economy. But the circular economy really is our technical materials that go back to human technology. So I call it the circular technosphere. So we design things for humans, for our purposes, our intentions, and our use. But they're not living things. And so we have to strangely think about our design language because we call things life cycle assessment when they're looking for a dignified way to talk about sourcing and disposition. But remember, nature doesn't have resources. It has sources. And if our job to turn them into resources and use them again and again and again in a circular technosphere. And if they can return to nature, they become part of its regenerative recreation. So that's exciting. We can design this way. And I'm, I'm so excited about that. And we're looking at how many ways we can do this now as a species, requiring this immense humility because we don't necessarily want to do geoengineering except in the age or the epoch of the Anthropocene. We are doing global engineering. Look at what we've done to the planet. So we can start to come back and think about restoration. We can come back and regeneration, reuse, recycling. But the poetry of all this is to start almost with the word refuse. So let's refuse the things we were doing that were wrong. That's why net zero is so popular. But it's really for those of us who have been damaging the world to be net zero for the next generation. And we'll tell them, all right, we'll try and leave you with nothing. But that, that's not such a great message for the next generation. They want to be 100% fabulous. So yes, we'll try and be as least bad as we can, but let's let the next generation go for 100% good, net positive. And let's design things in these cycles that work. So if we look at that, it's time to, to put down our old tools and take up new tools. And as designers, we know this. I had the great privilege of working with a great American photographer Walker Evans, who famously photographed large format and took pictures of sharecroppers in the South and the old circus posters. And, and it was really the beginning of pop art in my perception in the US. But he was sort of the Flaubert of photography. And when you look at it, and then you t think about a meeting I had with him, we were out photographing and I'm working with a view camera. This is 1973. And he has an SX-70, because he was very small and had some major surgery. And he was using a Polaroid. I said, Mr. Evans, I will carry a view camera for you if you'd like to use the large cameras. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. When I was your age, I could carry 40 pounds of equipment. And then when the 4x5s came along, press cameras, we could go yeah, to the factories. And then when the Leica came along or the, or the Rolleiflex, we go inside the factory. And then with the Leicas, we could go inside a subway, silent. And then here I am today, and I can do this. Zzzt. Here, portrait of William McDonough by Walker Evans. And he said, every 10 years, put down your tools and take up the new tools. Because if I was still using a giant view camera with all the chemistry and materials, I would have only had one life. So I say to the designers today, especially the young designers, take up the new tools, get principle, create a fulcrum, do the things that you believe are right. Work from your values of right and wrong before you talk about value of number. Don't just try and be efficient, try to be effective. Don't just worry about how to the right thing to do something. First figure out what is the right thing to do, then do it the right way. So I think for design today, we've got an amazing question 
of what fulcrum are we going to use for the levers of change that we want to bring to the design equation on every level, everywhere, including our commerce. And so if we don't have a fulcrum, we can't use a lever. There was a newspaper that misquoted Archimedes and said, give me a lever and a place to stand and I can move the, raise the earth. Well, you can't raise the earth without a fulcrum. They missed the core of it, the thing that doesn't move. So what have you got that doesn't move? Let's think about that. It, we should be powered by the sun. We can clean water. We can treat each other with dignity and grace. And even on, on commerce, we can change the question of commerce from what we've done, which is how much can I get for how little I give, to how much can we give? How much can we give for how much we get? So instead of it being a world of personality and greed and limits, it's actually a world of, of a community engaged in abundance and sharing. And that can be by design. So designing buildings that are convertible to housing in the future. That's what we do with our office buildings. Designing buildings that are safe for the people who are in it. Designing buildings that have reusable materials that are cataloged carefully for future generations. How can we be more good, not just less bad? Because if we're bad, being less bad is still bad by definition. So the question is how to be good. And if that isn't a fundamental design question, I don't know what is. And if you need a model and a mentor, take a breath, look around. There's a big transition here. And as a child in Japan, as a little child, my mother, who spoke Japanese, my parents both spoke Japanese, was studying Ikebana. And I'm a little kid, and I'm watching my mother make these flower arrangements. And I said, Mommy, those are beautiful flowers. And she, she said, yes, but look at the space between the flowers. It's what the Japanese call ma. It's the space between. It's an interval. So think about the ma now. Take a breath, realize where we are, realize how we got here. Imagine the direction and the, the destination over the horizon we offer the next generation. Let's think about intergenerational stewardship instead of simply sustainability or maintenance. This is a creative act. It's a design act. And so for the UK Design Council, Let's all follow the laws of nature and get back to work. Nature doesn't have a design problem. People do. Thank you.